stay tuned because for the next 60 minutes, Motorsports Unlimited is on the air. Hi, I'm Jerry Bryant, and these are the lovely ladies of Motorsports. And all this hour, we're going to have 60 minutes of action-packed excitement. All kinds of exciting things will happen. And we got the famous Bill Wilt, and we got all kinds of other good stuff that's happening all this hour. Motorsports Unlimited, 60 minutes of non-stop action. So let's go to the studio right now, huh? Thanks, Jerry, and hi, everybody. Welcome to the studio headquarters of Chicagoland's most watched, most talked about Access Television series. I'm Bill Wilt, and this is the 1,409th edition of Motorsports Unlimited. Boy, I hope I've got that right. 1,409th. I'm pretty sure, but this switching back and forth between the three rock shows and the explanation efforts seems to be adding confusion instead of simplifying things. Not that anyone is still trying to follow it after all this time. Uh, talking to folks every week, as I've done for so many years, is a lot easier. Anyway, if you are trying to follow what I'm doing, this is the sixth part of the explanation shows I created within Motorsports Unlimited to let you know what's going on. After 30 years of producing weekly shows, I thought people might wonder what happened when all of a sudden the same shows are on week after week. I decided to produce some simple programming done in the studio to explain. I thought it might take one or two shows to bring you up to speed and then I'd be back in action. Obviously, it hasn't turned out that way. By the time I got to the fourth explanation show designed basically to provide a medical update along with some classic Motorsports Unlimited action footage, I decided given that I wasn't improving physically as fast as I anticipated, I'd take some time to provide an explanation about why I created Motorsports Unlimited and what I was trying to accomplish. After getting the first one of these done, I realized Thanksgiving was rapidly approaching and 2015 would mark our 20th year of acknowledging an important event, America's first auto race held on Thanksgiving Day 1895 right here in Chicago. I really didn't want to blow it. I decided to give it a try. I felt I needed to test myself anyway. It wasn't easy and while I was able to tape the shows, it took its toll on me. Worse, editing the material took forever so getting it on the air was long delayed. In any event, we ended up creating three Rock 2015 shows, which hopefully you've just seen. Then I aired the fifth explanation show, which has now turned into a few minutes of medical update and the bulk of it explaining the purpose of Motorsports Unlimited. <laughs> I hope it's clear. We aired four explanation shows, then three Rock 2015 shows interrupting the explanation shows, then one more explanation show, explanation five. And today it's explanation six, which will hopefully pick up where explanation five left off. Now, while you think about all that, here is a little traditional Motorsports Unlimited footage so you don't forget what series you're watching. Nitromethane can be pretty hazard and you don't fool around with this stuff even when you're not at the racetrack where this, all the stuff is required. No, not at all. You don't play with it at all. It's, it can be pretty dangerous. All right, this is serious stuff. This is for the serious racers. So if you would, go right ahead and do your work and we'll try to describe as we stand off to the side. And guys, are you ready to hold your ears? Yes, we yeah, are. Yeah, we are. I saw them mm -hmm. in that. It scared me. It reminded me of like the X-Men or something. That <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, these guys are, these guys are suited up for a reason though. Go right ahead, guys, anytime you're ready. <laughs> Right. 
All right, girls. At the, oh, at the, yeah. That was wild. <laughs> at the end now, did you notice that the engine got a little bit quieter just before they shut it down? Because uh -huh. he was squirting gasoline back into it. Uh, uh, it you, you know, so you don't shut it down on nitro. We're shutting it down. Now that we have established you are watching Motorsports Unlimited, despite all of this talking, it's time to continue with my explanation of what Motorsports Unlimited is all about. Hopefully by now you understand that when I was a young motorsport participant, I knew there was something wrong. I mean, we'd show up at a racetrack to race our car, motorcycle, snowmobile, boat, airplane. It really didn't make any difference. We were expected to pay to race. It didn't seem to be strange to anyone else, but it was strange to me. After all, we were the show. We were the reason people bought tickets to watch, yet we had to pay to race. It didn't make any difference if it was stock cars or motorcycles. There was always an entry fee. Over time, I learned it wasn't the track's fault or the promoter's fault. There weren't enough spectators to cover the bills. Thus, those of us who raced had to pay. The truth is, most of the time, we were racing for our own money. I think most of us soldiered on thinking if we could work our way up to winning the Indy 500 or the Daytona 500, we'd have a real payday that would cover all we'd invested. Still, it didn't seem right. There was no reason motorsport activities couldn't attract enough public attention to generate enough revenue to pay the racers. Looking around, I could see other competitors in the sports entertainment marketplace were able to pay their participants. I remember when it was announced that Mickey Mantle was the first baseball player to get a $100,000 a year contract. $100,000 a year for hitting a baseball. We couldn't believe it. What was wrong with us? The difference was television. I knew it 60 years ago, and it's still true today. The constant, near endless presence on television of baseball, football, basketball, et al. was advancing the commercial interests of those we compete with for public attention. And it was killing us. Now, I want to take a moment to define television. The fact is, everything with a cathode ray tube isn't television at least not the television I'm talking about. I've debated this many times when people call my attention to the fact that with the internet, everybody can spread the word about their particular discipline, to which I happily respond. Oh, that's good. Then I guess network television won't object when I suggest they use the internet instead of the public airwaves when I insist motorsport has the same presence as the sports they traditionally cover. Oh, after a period of perhaps a decade when only motorsports is presented because of our long-standing grievance of our community, with television. I mean, if the internet is good enough for us, it's good enough for them. This is not a subject I'm unfamiliar with. Often people will counter with, well, Bill, what about you? You've been on television for 30 years. Again, everything with a cathode ray tube, and I suppose I should add an LED screen now, isn't the television to which I'm referring. What I'm talking about is network television. I'm talking about the television that politicians are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on in order to present themselves to the public. Any misunderstanding is just people playing dumb. Network television and all its tentacles are the most persuasive, most pervasive communications medium ever developed by mankind, and it influences everything we think and feel. Don't believe me? Let me ask you, when was the last time you ever saw a union official or union in a flattering portrayal on television? Oh, I'm not talking about news items. I'm talking about sitcoms or dramas. When was the last time you saw a flattering portrayal? I'll tell you the answer. Never. Yet, unions are a part of our daily lives. They are responsible for the 40-hour work week, the 8-hour work day, extra pay for overtime. They are responsible for the middle class. Yet, they are always presented as thugs or evil wrongdoers. As a 73-year-old man, I've seen our nation's attitude towards unions change over the decades. There was a time in my lifetime when the majority of workers were in a union. And now it's a minority. I've watched their omission from television, or when they are included, it's a negative portrayal, change the public's attitude. Coincidence? I don't believe in coincidences. I see a direct relationship. Heck, I watched it happen. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it isn't my area of expertise, but I want you to know motorsport isn't the only victim of television's control by the wealthy and privileged. Not by a long shot. I could easily point at horse racing and its demise. While it's not my area of interest, one can't help but notice the continual closing of horse racing tracks over the years. Again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because it's not my area of expertise. I don't know the horse racing story. 
but I can see the demise in my peripheral vision and at the same time make note of the fact that horse racing, like motorsport, is omitted from television sports news. That's for those folks to think about. My concern is the motorsport community and our horrific losses and the price our society has paid for squandering its attention on frivolous activities. Television has power no one ever anticipated. The ability to whisper in the ear and place powerful images in front of an entire nation at one time is the stuff of dreams of those who would seek to dominate our thinking. The question today is the same question I asked more than 30 years ago when I realized the only thing that gives television this enormous power is the public airwaves. The question, who gets to use them and for what purpose? And that was the beginning of Motorsports Unlimited. The public airwaves. Who gets to use them and for what purpose? That was what it boiled down to 30 years ago when I concluded that motorsports omission from television was killing us. Worse, our competitors for public attention, Major League Baseball, Pro Football, the NBA, et al., received constant non-stop television attention. I knew it was killing our sport and after numerous letters went unanswered, except one, and we'll get to that, I knew they were not going to be willing to include motorsport as an equal competitor in the sports entertainment marketplace. So now what? For me, the answer was simple. Leaving this activity, motorsport, was not an option for me as it had been for so many others. Nor could I let things go as they were because I knew that meant a slow, torturous path ending with the inevitable death of motorsport and all that went with it. Not exactly something I could accept. I pondered the notion of public airwaves and what it must mean. I'm the public, why can't I use them? That's what began my investigation into the history of broadcast regulations as I've already alluded to the Radio Act of 1927, the Communications Act of 1934. I even went so far as to investigating Supreme Court cases involving the broadcast industry, particularly the Red Lion case, where the Supreme Court said in no uncertain terms that the airwaves were in fact a public resource. Now, back to the question of who gets to use them and for what purpose. I can tell you, nobody knows including the Supreme Court. Yes, it's easy to point out that the public airways belong to the public, but not so easy to say how. Apparently, the broadcasters have interpreted this to mean they can do whatever they want. I mean, it's obvious. There used to be regulations limiting commercial time in each 30 minutes of programming. Today, they regularly show one-hour infomercials, meaning the entire hour is a commercial. Worse, they commonly use the news programs to promote their own programming later in the evening, their product. I think they feel they're going to keep pushing the boundaries until someone stops them. If that's true, one might ask, who can stop them? Think about it. Perhaps the most powerful entity in America, brandishing the power to select our leaders and decide which products survive in the marketplace, and no one is watching them? I think it's well past time to open this discussion given the unparalleled power of the public airwaves. Is it ever appropriate to use them to move product? Is that really what we want our precious airwaves used for? Remember, these are your airwaves. Those licensed to use them do so only with your permission. What? You don't remember giving your permission? You did it at the ballot box. The people you elected represented you in the granting of that permission. Of course, as you've probably already gathered, they don't have my permission. But what can I do about it? Studying the legislation that created the broadcast industry and newspaper accounts of the period is not my idea of having a good time. I'd much rather be building engines, designing chassis, and exploring new technology. The fact is, I knew I couldn't pursue these interests as long as motorsport couldn't compete in the sports entertainment marketplace. In fact, if things continued as they were, this was 30 years ago, motorsport would cease to exist. No more tracks, no more racing. No exploring new technical ideas for those of us so inclined. For those who don't know what I'm talking about, allow me to take a few minutes to repeat a story I've told before and I think makes my point. 
I'm sure everyone knows the name Werner von Braun. For those who don't, Werner von Braun is the father of our space program. He was one of the German scientists we plucked from Germany following World War II. He was the chief designer and engineer of the German rocket program in Punaminda. In large part, he was responsible for the V-2 rockets, the first vehicles to reach space. When he was brought to America, he ended up in charge of the American space program and was more responsible than anyone for the United States landing a man on the moon and bringing him back safely. This achievement was a big part of my life when I was a young man. I read everything I could about the space program and of course Werner von Braun. What I found particularly interesting was Werner's early life. It seems as a teenager in Germany, his hobby was rocketry and he built and flew small rockets in a vacant lot in his town. Of course, like every other motorsport participant, he constantly struggled for money to build his rockets. He began noticing people showing up to watch him launch his rockets at the vacant lot, typically on weekends. It soon occurred to him if he charged a fee for people to watch, he would have more money to build larger, faster rockets. In effect, the show he was putting on became the way he funded his early rocket research, motorsport. Similarly, motorsport participants today, 2016 as I write this, need the money provided by audience to continue their work. Of course, this is 2016 in America not pre-World War II Germany. In America, one has to compete in the sports entertainment marketplace to attract audience and generate revenue. And, of course, as I've been trying to point out, without television, atten te uh, television attention, it is impossible. I've often wondered how many wonderful ideas never had a chance to be developed because of lack of resources. When one sees the amount of money lavished on football, baseball, basketball, et al., not just the players, but the owners too, I'm talking about the amount of money our society heaps on these activities, yet gets nothing in return except frivolous entertainment. Anyway, I'll get back to that. But at this point, I'm trying to explain the origin of Motorsports Unlimited. While researching the broadcast industry, I noticed something that didn't make any sense. There was a passage in one of the pieces I read that referred to public access. Hmm, I thought. I'm the public. I don't have access. What are they talking about? It turned out they were talking about cable television. At that time, 30 years ago, remember? Cable was brand new and we really didn't know what to make of it. I was one of the first to sign up for it in my thirst for motorsports on television. It was interesting. When the cable guy hooked it up and turned it on, the first thing I saw was a sprint car race. I thought this was going to be great. Motorsports and no commercials. <laughs> yes, in the early years, those of us who signed up for cable thought there wouldn't be any commercials because we were paying for it. As it turned out, there was many commercials on network television. Worse, the sprint car race that was on when the cable guy hooked me up was never seen again. You have to remember, this was before NASCAR became a big part of ESPN and later network television. Cable, like network television, had no motorsport programming. Still, I wanted to learn more about it. It was my intention to sue ABC, CBS, and NBC, and the FCC for misuse of the public airways, and I felt I needed to know about cable to be fully informed in my quest to take television to the Supreme Court to solve this television problem that was killing the motorsport community. I said it so often that one day, a guy in a group I was talking to, pitching my ideas, happened to be a lawyer. He said, <laughs> Do you know what it costs to take a case to the Supreme Court? I didn't, and was astonished to hear how difficult and expensive it was to get to the Supreme Court. Millions. Not what I wanted to hear. About that time, I heard something on my newly acquired cable that caught my ear. It was some kind of a hearing regarding cable television, and the person speaking for the cable industry pointed out what a wonderful thing the cable industry, industry was doing, providing public access. There it was again public access. I was determined to find out more about this. Public access television. More accurately, public access cable television. I was off to the library. You have to remember, this was before the internet. I began researching cable television to see if public access meant what it sounded like, the public having access. As I dug into the subject, it became obvious that I wasn't the first to question how the public airways were being used. I suppose I should have been able to guess as much when I discovered how many Supreme Court cases had been brought against the broadcast industry. 
especially after learning how much it costs to go through the process. One doesn't do it unless they think they have been seriously wronged. Unfortunately, the Supreme Court really didn't have any answers other than declaring that the airwaves are in fact a public resource. I could find no directive regarding a solution. It seems that 30 years ago, the FCC, that's the Federal Communications Commission, wasn't the empty office it appears to be today. There were a number of written pieces indicating the FCC was more than fed up with the broadcast industry's failure to share the airwaves. In addition, there were pressure groups trying to ensure the public had access to the airwaves. This was all news to me as I hadn't heard anything about it until I started digging and even then it wasn't easy to find information. Without going through all the reasons cable came into being, including poor reception of the broadcast signal in mountainous areas, when the cable industry was created, the FCC, fed up with the foot dragging of the broadcast industry, required prospective cable operators to provide public access. And public access meant they had to provide a channel for the public to use for free, and they had to provide the public with video equipment for free, and they had to teach people how to use the equipment for free, and they had to air whatever they produced for free. Now, there were a couple of caveats. First, the programs the public access producers created could not contain commercials. Second, the programs couldn't be part of a gambling operation. I was elated. Here was what appeared to be a genuine opportunity for the motorsport community to be presented on television. The rules didn't seem overly restrictive. After all, if you're not paying for the equipment or the airtime, you probably shouldn't be selling commercial space. I have no interest in gambling, so that shouldn't be a problem either. Of course, it occurred to me that there must be something in it for the cable companies too. I mean, it's fine to say a channel to use for free, equipment for free, classes for free, but this stuff costs money. Why should they do it? Again, one has to remember, cable was new to our area 30 years ago. We had much to learn. As it turned out, in order to operate, the cable operator had to use things that belonged to us, like the right of ways to string their cables across our streets and alleys. Certainly we couldn't do it. We weren't allowed to string wire on telephone poles or across streets. In addition, the cable operators had to have special business privileges. They had what amounted to a monopoly in the areas where they were the successful bidder. There was more, but I knew enough so I didn't have to feel guilty about using their stuff. They were getting plenty, and in return, they had obligations. It seemed like a fair arrangement. On top of that, nobody is forced to be a cable operator. In fact, they compete with each other, town by town, to be the selected cable company. At the time, there were more than 20 cable companies serving the Chicagoland area, and that didn't include Chicago. Most have forgotten that the Chicago suburbs had cable about two years before the city. As one might expect, Chicago was a huge prize that had to be divvied up carefully. I can't even imagine the interests that had to be served and the politics involved. Chicago eventually got cable, but it took a while. At the time, I was living in the suburbs and my cable operator was Continental Cablevision. After learning of what appeared to be an opportunity to get the motorsport community on the air, or I guess I should say on cable, well, it was sort of on the air. At least the people saw it on the same TV set that brought them ABC, CBS, and NBC. Anyway, I had to find out what I needed to do to get started. I dropped by Continental Cablevision in Elmhurst where I was told to go, only to find out nobody knew what I was talking about. Public access? Don't know anything about it. I could see this was the place where you paid your bills, so I thought I must have gone to the somewhere else or the wrong place. Only thing was, nobody knew where or even what I was talking about. I started making phone calls. After some trying, I got someone who had heard about public access only to learn my suburb didn't have a studio. Further inquiry, I don't go away easily, yielded some odd information. Would I be willing to go to Westmont to take the classes? I guess, if that's where they have them. It seems strange, why Westmont? It was about 15 miles away. Not that big of a deal, but not exactly convenient either. Oh well, whatever. I was determined to get motorsport and its people on television, and if I had to drive 15 miles to take the classes, I'd do it. I found out there were only four or five classes anyway, so I thought, let's get on with it. Meanwhile, while I was trying to figure out how this public access thing was going to work, I'd come in contact with people who know more about it than I did. Some were in other parts of the country, and they had cable for several years. The general attitude seemed to be, Bill, 
you don't want to bother with it. Nobody watches those channels. It's usually boring village board meetings or some fool who thinks he's the next television discovery. This didn't discourage me at all. What I wanted to know was, is it a legitimate opportunity to be on the air? Is it a real opportunity to get the public interested in motorsport and get to know motorsport people and help them develop an appreciation for what these folks do? Apparently, it was. I didn't care if anybody was watching the channel. I knew I could figure out a way to get people to watch, but first, we had to be on the air. I signed up for the classes in Westmont and awaited the call. After receiving the call, I took the classes and began making plans for the show I was going to do about motorsports. I needed to create something special because what I wanted was a show about motorsports for people who don't care about motorsports. I know, it sounds strange, but my objective was to get people to watch who weren't involved or even interested in motorsports. It seemed to me we needed to talk to people who weren't part of the motorsport community. We already knew how wonderful we were. We didn't need to be convinced. We weren't the ones who were closing our racetracks or intolerant of our activities. It was the general public, and my objective was to help the general public develop an understanding and appreciation of the motorsport community and its activities. This was not an easy task, to develop a television show about motorsports for people who are not interested in motorsports. Adding to the difficulty, I had no money, no budget at all. Public access television was free, but that didn't mean it didn't cost money. Yes, the classes were free and use of the equipment was free, but that didn't do anything but tease you. The fact is, as I was about to learn, that just puts you on the sidewalk with a load of video equipment. There was a long way to go. First, I needed a subject, a subject that would be patient as I learned and taught friends how to use the video equipment. No real problem. I had plenty of friends involved in motorsport, and most were technically minded, so the video and audio equipment wouldn't be a mystery. Okay, now I have the borrowed video and audio equipment. I needed a subject. As I recall, my first subject was a friend, Walt Modelski, with his Formula Atlantic race car. Then we needed a place to shoot the program. We measured the car, and it looked like it would fit into the Westmont studio. Okay, camera, check. Microphone, check. Tape, check. Subject checked. So far, we have enough to shoot a program about Walt and his Formula Atlantic car, which would be fine if I wanted a TV program that would appeal to fellow gearheads. I didn't. Going through all this effort to tell a few people who probably already knew about Formula Atlantic racing wasn't what I had in mind. If we were ever going to get the general public to have a consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of motorsports, I needed a hook to grab their attention. Beyond that, Many of the access channels were located on obscure channels. I'd had cable long enough to know whatever audience we would attract would come from people flipping through the channels during commercials on traditional channels. You have to remember, this was early in the life of cable. The term channel surfing hadn't been invented yet, but I found myself flipping through the channels during commercials on programming I was used to watching. I know it's difficult for most people to remember, but when cable was introduced, we basically had four channels, NBC, ABC, and CBS. They were the big three. And then there was WGN, more of a local station at the time. I would be remiss if I didn't mention UHF. This was sort of a low-budget deal that was difficult to tune in and had two channels some of the time, as I recall. Certainly, there was no channel surfing. From my experience, flipping through the channels, I felt I had roughly two seconds to put an image on the screen that would keep people from clicking the button again. Certainly I knew I couldn't do it, nor could the visual effect of race cars, motorcycles, boats, aircraft, and all the rest. They had too long existed in obscurity. Of course, if I had money to throw around, it could have been easy. I could have hired Elvis Presley to host the show and his appearance certainly would have stopped people from pushing the button. But I didn't have Elvis money or any money for that matter, not to mention he had already passed away at the time. But you get the point, the celebrities were out of the question. So, with no money to spend and in need of a way to instantly command attention, I knew what would work. I'd learned in my life that nothing on this planet attracts attention like a pretty girl. I don't think this line of thinking should be a surprise to anyone. But how? I had no money. Models cost money too, maybe not celebrity money, 
but money nonetheless. It seemed to me that while I didn't have any money, that didn't mean I didn't have something of value. It seemed to me if I were an aspiring model or actress, I'd be looking for opportunities for exposure and experience. I felt I had something to offer them in exchange for their ability to attract an audience. Of course, it takes more than a pretty face to attract an audience. That might work at the local bar, but this was television. There is lots of competition for public attention on television. Heck, it was possible one of the competing stations would be airing an old Elvis movie. No, it was going to have to be something along the lines of Vegas Showgirls. It was going to have to be colorful, skimpy, and cute sexy. Now, this can be tricky. There's a difference between cute sexy and coarse sexy, and I was determined to set the right tone. In addition, I remind you, I had no money. You can imagine my surprise to learn that those beautiful ostrich feathers on the Vegas show costumes cost $20 each in 1986. It wouldn't be hard to spend $1,000 on feathers for a single costume, and I had zero dollars. It wasn't just ostrich feathers. It takes more than feathers to make the costumes I had in mind. Fortunately, at the time, there were a number of exercise shows on cable featuring female talent in leotards. Of particular interest to me was something called a suspender tart. I thought it looked a little fancier than the normal tights, and with the addition of high heels instead of sneakers and a few feathers, I felt I could pull off a sort of Vegas look, but still practical for working in a motorsport environment. While I would have loved to use a full Vegas-style costume, it would have meant each girl would have to have had an attendant along with them protecting the fragile costume. That was out of the question. No, I thought the suspender tards with heels and feathers would get me close enough to the look I wanted while still being practical, without being coarse or overly provocative. As I said, I wanted cute sexy. A trip to the local uh, dance supply store and I had the right ingredients to create show-stopping television look that would stop people flipping through the channels long enough to hear what we were talking about. Of course, it was more complicated than that. I don't want to tell you what a dozen pair of high heels in various sizes cost, not to mention the proper show quality pantyhose at $15 a pop. Anyway, I got it done. Oh yes, I needed girls. There was a showbiz trade publication at the time called Audition News. I ran an ad laying out what I had in mind. I needed attractive girls with a figure appropriate for exercise wear to participate in a cable TV show about motorsports. They will have an opportunity to introduce themselves with their name on the screen during the program and their image and name would also appear at the end of the show. In addition, they would have an opportunity to learn how to conduct interviews and there would be a fair amount of teleprompter work. There is no pay involved, but we don't expect them to know how to do anything and part of what we were offering was a learning opportunity and we expected that we would have to teach them. As I said earlier, we had exposure and experience to offer and all they had to do was show up. Of course, the first couple of shows featured my wife and the wives and girlfriends of buddies. Some did it for the fun of it, some because they had some interest in show business. It really didn't make any difference to me. I wanted the motorsport girls to be on camera all the time, and this served the interest of those interested in developing a show business career. Camera time is important. The idea of someone flipping through the channels and when they got to Motorsports Unlimited, my face would be on the screen and they would click the button again, never left me. Because of this concern, the motorsport concerns, the motorsport girls were a part of everything we did from car shows to welding shows. The girls were the stars and on camera. But I'm getting way ahead of myself. I just wanted to give you an idea of what I had in mind to attract some attention to motorsport. So, if you're following this, I now had the video and audio equipment, I had a subject, Walt Modelski's Formula Atlantic car, I had a studio, I had a hook, the Motorsport Girls, everything seemed to be in order. I booked the studio time and started preparing for the first public access episode of Motorsports Unlimited. Of course, Walt's Formula Atlantic car wouldn't fit in the studio as we'd planned, so we shot the program in a small parking lot just outside the back door of the studio. This in and of itself wouldn't have been a major disaster, but let's see, how can I explain this? I guess I should first explain how this public access stuff works when you actually start sawing and hammering. Uh, that's my cute little way of saying the theory is over and it's time to get something on tape. Please remember, this was 30 years ago. 
The way it worked was the cable company has an employee there at all times. This made sense as there is lots of very expensive equipment laying around and I could see they needed to protect their interests. In addition to keeping an eye on their stuff, the cable company employee would assist if the access participant encountered any technical problems. Of course, I was learning as I went along. It seems that it takes more than one person to shoot a program in the studio, although I would later prove it can be done with nobody helping. Anyway, the reality is, ideally, you needed three cameramen, a director, an audio person, a technical director, a floor director, uh, there's more, but you get the idea. It seems that traditionally public access participants help each other with their shows. In other words, if someone else is shooting a program, they would gather up a crew by calling around to other participants to get help. In exchange, they would volunteer to work on someone else's show. It seemed fair enough. Anyway, back to shooting Walt Modelski's Formula Atlantic car. After getting his car situated in a small parking lot, taking into account the direction of the sunlight, audio concerns, uh, we were ready. At this time, I went back into the studio to bring the two motorsport girls who had been getting into costume and makeup out and positioned them strategically by the car. The Continental Cablevision employee happened to be a woman, and when she saw the girls, her attitude changed. Not that it had been all that great to begin with, but I know serious attitude when I see it, and I saw it. I expected some pushback at the beginning before people got used to us and learned we were harmless, but I was a little surprised that someone in show business would be taken aback. Now, one has to understand, as I was about to learn, the cable company employees at the public access level are literally children themselves. Typically, they went to a school like Columbia, and after graduating, they were looking for opportunities to work their way into television. It seems working for a cable company in the production department was something of a first rung of the television ladder. So we really weren't uh, getting people that were, you know, had years of experience in the television industry. No, in any case, uh, I was a good 20 years older than the cable company employee. Anyway, it was clear she didn't like the girls as part of the production, and of course, I didn't really care. I had a plan to bring motorsport to the attention of people who had no interest in motorsport, and I wasn't about to let youngsters who knew which buttons to push to get something on tape but had never been responsible for attracting an audience, influence what Motorsports Unlimited was going to look like. Besides, I figured once she began to see the production unfold, she would get the idea of how the motorsport girls would participate and perhaps even see the wisdom of what I was doing. Of course, the girls were decorative and, as I've often said, nothing on this planet attracts attention like a pretty girl. But in addition, I wanted them to be full participants in the program. What I had in mind was between myself and my guest or guests, we would explain the car or boat or aircraft or whatever we were shooting to our motorsport girls and the audience would learn along with them. The girls weren't there to teach, they were there to learn and the audience would learn along with them. They were encouraged to ask questions and if they didn't understand, stop us and say it. If the girls didn't understand what we were saying, then it was sure that our target audience, the general public, didn't understand either. There were a couple of reasons for encouraging the girls to participate. First. When the girls asked questions, it kept them on camera, which is what I wanted. Second, because they rarely knew anything about motorsport, they asked the absolute best questions, the kind of questions people unfamiliar with motorsport might ask. I have many examples of this, but the one I like best occurred a couple of years later when we were taping a show about stock car racing. We had two cars in another studio, one completely painted and lettered, the other had no bodywork so people could see the frame, suspension, and running gear. We also had the owner of the car and the chassis builder and the driver. I thought I was doing a pretty good job with the most basic explanation of why the car was built the way it was built and what they were trying to accomplish. About halfway through, through the show, one of the girls said, uh, interrupted us and said, uh, with a quizzical look on her face, are you guys saying this car won't turn to the right or can't turn to the right? I, I don't understand. The driver, the car owner, the chassis builder, and me all looked at each other in astonishment. We assumed everyone knew that most American racing is oval track racing, and oval track racing is left turns only. Thus, when the race cars are designed and built, they are heavily biased toward making left turns. In most cases, a driver could let go of the steering wheel and the car would immediately turn left. And, of course, the car would be a handful trying to make a right turn. We assume everyone knows this. But if you didn't, the previous half of the show, in which we explained how the suspension and steering geometry was set up, made no sense. The girl's innocent question gave us an opportunity to explain what we previously explained, but in a way everyone could understand. 
The interesting thing about this story is I've told it many times over the years, usually to explain why the girls were on the show. And 80% of the time, the person to whom I was telling the story said, I didn't know that either. To those of us in the motorsport community, this is basic common knowledge. It would never occur to us that people wouldn't know that most American racing is oval track and oval tracks are left turns only. One would think everyone at one time or another would have seen some footage of the Indy 500. I mean, it's the largest sporting event in the world and of course, left turns only. In a way, the girls represented the general public audience we were trying to reach. Often things that would have never occurred to us in the motorsport community, people didn't really know like left turns only. Oh yes, <laughs> back to our first shoot and the difficulty with the cable company employee. Normally, I wouldn't really be concerned about what the cable company employee thought, but as the weeks went by, I became, it became apparent I was going to need her help if the Westmont thing was going to work out. You see, I lived in Franklin Park and the Westmont studio was a good 45 minutes from Franklin Park. Not really that big of a deal for me, but it was quite a burden for friends, perhaps not as committed as I was to saving motorsport, to make the trek. Then the government decided to put Route 83 under construction and the 45 minute trip became an hour and a half trip. I was sort of running out of patience. You see, the way this public access thing works in practice is one gets their friends to help with the production and between that and others who also depend on volunteers to do their shows, you should be able to round up enough people to tape a show. Between an hour and a half ride to Westmont, not to mention an hour and a half back, and a hostile cable company employee, it was getting increasingly difficult for me to convince friends to give up their evening to help me with this television thing. I didn't really blame them. It's a ton of work and nobody gets paid, so in addition to giving up time, it cost them gas money too. I was becoming aware that this Westmont deal wasn't going to work. While I was committed to doing whatever it took to get my community on television, the burden of doing it in the Westmont was becoming impossible and I was questioning why I was running my tail off trying to produce programming in Westmont. I guess I should explain that by now I was getting the hang of this television thing. As it turned out, going to the studio to shoot a program was only a small part of producing a television show. It's basically a three-part process, acquisition, editing, and distribution. Acquisition means the stuff you shoot that will make up the program. For example, we shoot a lot of car shows. In the case of a car show, we would go to the show and pick interesting cars and people to interview. Typically, interviews are between three and seven minutes long. After taping enough material for a one hour show, usually about 53 minutes, we would take our acquired footage and go home. This isn't the end of the acquisition. First, I had to take the acquired footage to the studio and add music to the pieces that needed it, and at the same time, review the material and write the inserts. The inserts are the pieces where the motorsport girls are photographed on the blue background while they read the text of the insert from the teleprompter. It might go something like this. Now, <laughs> you have to picture me as a cute, pretty girl in costume. <clears throat> that was a beautiful Corvette built by a talented builder, but there were more than Corvettes there that day. Check out this outstanding traditional American street rod. It works better with a girl doing it, but you get the idea. This insert would be edited between an interview of someone with a Corvette and an interview with someone with a traditional American street rod. It makes a story out of the acquired footage. In effect, the inserts are more acquisition footage, but they're taped in the studio because of the need for a teleprompter. So after we have the acquisition footage taped on location and the inserts taped in the studio, it's time for editing. Editing was the most difficult part of the learning process, both technically and from a storytelling perspective. It's also the most time consuming part of the process. Over the years, I would learn I would spend between 40 and 60 hours editing each show. Editing will make or break a program, so it's an area that requires full attention. Everything is important and not time consuming. For example, I mentioned adding music. Of course, the music selected is important and putting it in the interviews correctly is important. It's also time consuming. On average, I would spend four hours on each show just editing music into the interviews. What I'm getting at is it wasn't just going to the Westmont to shoot the program in the studio. I was going there every day to edit the material after I'd shot everything. It was a real burden trying to gather up friends every week to shoot in the studio and then running back and forth to Franklin Park every day. Add to that the hostile environment at the Westmont studio. Well, it didn't take long and I started looking for answers. As far as I was concerned, this was impossible. Producing television programs is a ton of work when everything goes right and you sure don't need obstacles thrown in your path. I wasn't about to give up this opportunity to get the motorsport community on television, but I had to find a way to make it work. 
Walt Modelsky's Atlantic Car took me weeks to edit and submit as a program, but at least I was getting the idea of how this public access thing was supposed to work. It wasn't going to be easy, but it didn't have to be this hard. It seemed to me I needed to look at the contract. You see, the various cable companies all compete with each other to get to be the cable provider in each of the communities. At that time, there were more than 20 cable companies serving the Chicago area. In the end, one of the competing cable companies gets the contract. It seems to me I needed to look at the contract. Looking at the contract revealed that Franklin Park was supposed to have its own studio and, in addition, there was a Franklin Park Cable Commission that, as I read, should have been fighting the war I was fighting. Very interesting, I thought. Why am I arguing with these people when the government has a Cable Commission to handle these things? As it turned out, at that time, almost all communities with cable service had some kind of commission. I decided to look into it. I'm tempted to go through the Great Cable Wars minute by minute, but I think I'll save it for my book. <laughs> Suffice to say, the next few years were absolutely miserable. During the early years of my public access participation, I used to say I could do a much better job on the show if I didn't have to spend half of my time fighting with the cable companies. It really got ugly in some of the communities. My position was clear. The cable operators weren't doing us any favors. They get something, and in return, they have to provide something. Public access wasn't an act of generosity. It was payment. It didn't seem complicated to me. Unlike the traditional television we had become accustomed to for 50 years, the cable operators had to use something that belonged to the people of the community they sought to do business with. I'm talking about the right-of-ways needed for them to string their cables across the alleys and streets, and let's not forget, they needed access and have the right to trim the trees and foliage that would interfere with their cables. The FCC apparently fed up with the decades of trying to get network television to share what amounted to an absolute stranglehold on the public airwaves, decided they weren't going to go through this again with the newly emerging cable industry. The FCC made it clear from the beginning, if you want to be a cable operator, part of what you have to do is, one, make a channel available for the public to use for free. Two, provide video equipment for the public to use for free. Three, teach the public how to use the video equipment for free. Four, air whatever they produce for free. It really wasn't complicated, but based on what I encountered, the cable operators had no intention of honoring their commitment. I found myself engaged in an almost impossible fight to acquire meaningful public access from the beginning in addition to learning how to use the video and audio equipment, not to mention master editing skills and the near endless tasks necessary to produce programming from rounding up guests to finding and costuming girls for the show, I was forced into making legal inquiries to find out if Continental Cablevision was a rogue cable company making a stand against the public access obligation or if the attitude was typical across the industry. As it turned out, in my view, at that time, 30 years ago, it was typical. The cable companies seemed to be doing everything possible to discourage public access participation. Many were tricking communities into surrendering the contractual obligation to provide public access. Typically, they would make participation so difficult and provide such a hostile environment, those stepping forward to participate would become discouraged and go away. Of course, there is also the problem that television production was so much work those doing it for the fun of it soon disappeared. It didn't make any difference why people didn't step forward to participate. The fact that they weren't there provided substance to the general cable company's argument to the community leadership, which went something like this. Nobody is using this public access stuff. How about allowing us to close the public access studio temporarily until there is some interest? Of course, closing and getting rid of the staffing of an expensive studio temporarily meant it would never be seen again. Another common cable company argument was to offer the community a deal. Let us close the public access studio and relieve us of the public access obligation and we'll build a complete television studio in your local high school. That way the kids can learn how to do television production and nobody is using the public access studio anyway. On the surface, it seems like a generous offer. 
the community gives up something that no one is using anyway and gets a television studio for their high school. What isn't obvious is what the community got was a room full of television stuff that wouldn't work in two or three years and would be completely obsolete and useless in five years. Meanwhile, they'd traded away the community's right to be heard on television and their children's right and their children's children's right and so on and so forth. You see, television equipment is high maintenance, requiring a full-time engineer to keep everything working correctly. Worse, television is a rapidly developing technology requiring continuous upgrades to stay useful. It's a little like the computer industry. It doesn't make any difference what you buy. It'll be outdated in six months and totally useless in a few years. It's the nature of electronics in a rapidly evolving technical world. So, building a television studio in the local high school isn't really a big deal. The big deal was getting the communities to release them from their public access obligation. The television hardware was perishable. Losing access was forever. Here I was working my tail off producing a television program about motorsports that would attract people who don't care about motorsports and at the same time vaulting unnecessary hurdles thrown at me by the cable company and trying to learn my legal rights concerning public access television left me, uh, not to mention it looked like uh, it was going to turn out to be not just a fight with the cable operators, it was going to be a fight with the government too. As I said early, earlier, I'm not going to provide a blow-by-blow -blow description of the years I call the Great Cable Wars. That would be way too lengthy, but you'll get the highlights. There was no question I soon learned that we were dealing with an industry bent on getting rid of public access television. And it wasn't just a local problem. It was, in fact, nationwide. My study of this problem soon led me to believe that public access television wasn't so much of a creation of the FCC to settle long-standing grievances the public had against network television's failure to share the public airwaves, but it was a response to others, like me, who were raising hell about the same old question that had been rolling around in my mind for decades. Who gets to use the public airwaves and for what purpose? Before I go any further, I want to take a moment to point out once again, my introduction to public access cable television took place 30 years ago and it isn't fair to hold current providers of public access cable responsible for what took place three decades earlier. The continental cable vision I originally dealt with has been gone for many years. As a matter of fact, I don't even recall how many times it changed ownership. I remember TCI was one of the owners, but there were others as various corporations endeavored to acquire more and more cable companies. Each time, my red flag antenna went up to see if there would be a negative effect on public access. I'm pleased and a little surprised to report the opposite is true. As of the beginning of 2017, I can honestly say there are no remnants of the great cable wars that took place during my first five years. I call them the great cable wars because they were. I spent more than a year attending a variety of cable commission meetings that had deteriorated to a point where the towns involved had to have their city attorney present and the cable companies had to send their attorney. In addition, newspapers were covering the story and people got fired. It wasn't pretty. I'll save going into specific details for the book and right now I'm trying to give credit where credit is due. I've often said the path of least resistance does not go through Bill Wilt. And it's true, but it is also true that I am a principled man who is fair and more than willing to reverse my position in the face of new facts. And here they are. Following the great cable wars in the late 80s, Continental Cablevision and I came to a compromise. Part of the compromise involved me agreeing to do my show at the Elmhurst studio. It was less than half the distance to Westmont and had superior studio, better equipment, etc. The deal was I'd quit insisting on the Franklin Park studio. I agreed to give Elmhurst a chance with the caveat that I had concerns about Elmhurst becoming too crowded with access participants and wouldn't be able to provide enough studio time for everyone if Elmhurst ended up being the fallback studio as other facilities closed. I was assured that wouldn't happen. Well, here we are, 25 years later, and they kept their word. Through ownership change after ownership change, they kept their word, and I kept mine. I guess the first few years I expected it to fall apart. 
I was pleased to see as time and years went by, it not only didn't fall apart, in fact, our relationship improved drastically. Perhaps they saw I didn't have a personal agenda. I wasn't trying to use access as a vehicle to achieve some kind of stardom. I was, in fact, sincere in my stated objective, raising public consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of the motorsport community and their activities. I can tell you, during the last decade or so, I've said many times while working at the studio, how nice it is to interact with people with please and thank you. It's the way I'd rather behave anyway. Better than that, my recent disabling surgery put me in a vulnerable position, a perfect opportunity for those who might want to destroy Motorsports Unlimited to do so. I'm more than a little pleased to report that didn't happen. The fact is the cable companies went out of their way to be helpful as I struggled through a difficult time. By the way, I should also mention CAC. I won't try to explain it here, but Chicago's public access system is quite different from the suburbs. And not thanking CAC, that's Chicago Access Corporation, for their help and patience would be an unacceptable slight. All of those who air Motorsports Unlimited have my thanks for making a difficult situation easier. You know, we usually judge folks for how they behave in accordance with contractual obligations and the like. But the real moral and ethical test is how people lend a hand when they don't have to. And that's what has me publicly appreciative of the generous help these folks previously mentioned, particularly Comcast and Elmhurst, provided. What I don't want is, while telling the story of the 30-year-old history of the problems I encountered, and you should know the story, trying to participate in public access television, to sully the work those currently delivering on the public access promise provide, and are doing it so well. As you may have noticed, I don't hesitate to criticize when it's appropriate. I'd also like to be known as someone who knows how to say thank you, particularly when people are being thanked for things they didn't have to do, and I do thank you. That's it for this week, except to acknowledge John Platania for helping me in the studio each week, even though he doesn't like these talking shows while I'm trying to make the best of a difficult situation. By the way, because of my continuing difficulties walking, not to mention pain, I sought a second opinion from another neurosurgeon. He thinks additional surgery is in order. As of January 2017, I'm considering it. I'll keep you informed as best I can. I'm Bill Wilt. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next week. This program made possible in part by support from ABC Auto Parts, located on Ashland Avenue at 138th Street in Blue Island, Illinois. Motorsports Unlimited is produced by Bill Wilt, president of the Motorsport Advancement Crusade. This program made possible in part by support from Jimmy's Red Hots, located on Grand Avenue and Pulaski Road in Chicago. Motorsports Unlimited was created to raise public consciousness, understanding, and appreciation of the motorsport community and their activities. You can contact us by email at msutv.com or email us directly at msutv at aol.com. We enjoy hearing from our audience and encourage you to let us know what you think. So that's it, another edition of Motorsports Unlimited and the lovely ladies of motorsports. And be with us next week because we'll have something real exciting. Bill Wilt's going to have the lovely ladies and just about anything can happen right here on Motorsports Unlimited. Every week at this time, we bring you the best in motorsports. So uh, be seeing you. Bye-bye. And uh, keep on rocking.